So I'm, I'm Jeff Alexander, Chief Executive of Gatwick Diamond Business, and we're very pleased to be sort of co-hosting this event today in, in partnership with the Manor Royal Business Improvement District. Um, so the main presentation, I think, is to come from, from Robert Coles of the Roffey Park Institute. And I'm going to try and get through the title, Robert, but there are so many R's in the title. I know. But I might struggle, but I'm going, but to, I'm going so, to give it a brave go. It's a, it's a Welsh mean you need to roll your R's. You know? I will roll my R. So it's <laughs> refocus, reshape, respond, readiness and resilience. There you <laughs> well, go. It's a readiness and resilience programme. And there's even an R in Robert. There is. So without any many more R's, I think I will just hand <laughs> over to you, Robert. And I see you've got your presentation nice and ready. So over to you. I have. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to, since we're on Zoom, uh, actually a couple of um, housekeeping bits. It's worthwhile if you have your Outlook email running, shutting it down uh, for the duration. Zoom tends to get interfered with by Outlook. And um, if you run uh, Microsoft Cloud, at the bottom right hand side of your screen, if you uh, right click on that and pause your syncing, that's the, those are two of the biggest culprits if you ever have Zoom problems. So do those two things, your, your Zoom will be much more stable. Um, so welcome to, to, the, uh, to the session. What we're going to do is, is talk you through uh, 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 um, a program we're putting together in, in consultation with, with several organizations and a couple of countries actually, um, which really is, is starting to think about uh, how we as, as business communities start to organize and regrow ourselves post the, the pandemic period. So we'll, we'll go through the talk and, and look at what we're doing and how it works, and then we'll open it up to a general discussion on, on some of the issues towards the end. And I think we've got just under one and a half hours um, uh, in total, but I'll, I'll, I'll not be talking for an hour and 20 minutes or anything ridiculous like that. So we'll, we'll get to the discussion as fast as we can. Um, so uh, once again, thanks to Jeff and thanks to Steve from, from Manor Royal Bid as well, uh, um, with whom we've already had conversations. And I hope this is of use and of benefit to all of you. Just a little bit about me. Uh, there's a bit of wishful thinking here, which is that's a picture of me uh, at home in France last year when the weather was warm and freedom reigned. And I'm looking forward to going back there again when it's allowed. So um, as Jeff has said, I'm the CEO of Ruffy Park Institute. Um, and we are headquartered in, in, in Horsham, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, my background um, ranges quite a bit. I've had one of what's known as a portfolio career, which I gather is what millennials do, but I've been doing that for a long time. So I uh, come from a fourth generation retail family, um, been involved in education, in theatre, uh, run one of the big audit and accounting firms, uh, as well as a large professional services firm and spent time in academia. So all of those things and a couple more. My research interests in business terms are around the uses and structures of dialogue and interaction, their effect on uh, leadership problem solving and decision making. And I'm also something of a Confucian scholar, uh, particularly as it relates to ideas of, of leadership management practice in, in a more uh, Asian oriented economy of the future. And that's a challenge that's probably not on many people's radars right now, but needs to be on the radars very soon in terms of uh, Chinese understanding of governance and good management practice is rather, rather different to the Anglo-American view of the world. Agenda for our talk today then, and talk about uh, the world we're about to emerge into, and it is a world of um, many uncertainties, uh, and how that's led to, to some of the thinking around the Enterprise Resilience and Readiness Programme. Uh, and what that program looks like and is designed to achieve. So let's start with, with uh, oh, by the way, a bit of a reminder since I uh, couldn't resist it, since we're all local businesses, but our, our campus, Rocky Park International Centre, is now open again. So if you 
you want to book meetings, board meetings, development meetings, get togethers, we're, we're there ready and open and COVID safe and all of those good things. So uh, I promised the team I would just flag that in passing. So coming into an emerging and um, different world, uh, part of my uh, work history over the years has been involved in, in conflict resolutions and, um, and intergovernmental and intercountry conflict uh, resolution. And it's interesting some of the terminology that's coming out of the UK versus Europe versus America regarding where we are and where we're going. Um, we're, certainly not at the beginning of the end of COVID by any means whatsoever in business terms. Uh, we are at the end of the beginning in the sense that the lockdown phase uh, is, is coming to an end. However, the, the business impact for, for many of us will only now start to play out as, uh, as it becomes more clear what the marketplace will do, how it might behave, uh, what uh, what impact long-term unemployment uh, will have uh, on on uh, on consumer spending and on confidence and all sorts of other things, and and in addition, of course, our own organisations have been in general hit hard. Not all sectors. Some sectors, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, have done very well, uh, and and of course, a lot of digital businesses have done extremely well. But many market sectors have have frankly taken a kicking and um and and that has ranged across uh um various impacts for example the business models that we might have been working to a year ago i guess for many of us are completely different now and uh my chairman and i often talk about the fact that we've gone through 10 years of change in 12 months uh, because we've had to uh, in order to remain relevant and, and fit and healthy. Um, Martin, being, being in on this call, will be fully well aware as, as, a, as a banker that many organizations have taken a financial hit uh, and, and are certainly a lot less healthy now than they were perhaps uh, 12 months ago. Equally, uh, I, I was doing a talk earlier on this morning. It's been a day of talks. The psychological and well-being and change aspects of, of our organizations are entirely disrupted. My view is that this uh, very broad assumption that, that we're all going to do homeworking forevermore is way too broad to be useful. And when you look at the restraining forces against that idea um, from basic things like having a Wi-Fi signal that stands up long enough to be usable all day, uh, through to other things like social isolation, people reporting increasing levels of stress and loneliness, and uh, allegedly, according to, to some uh, statistics, up to one in three uh, households either experiencing relationship breakdown or indeed domestic violence uh, as part of the um, background to 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 uh, the COVID lockdowns. So the truth is, we don't know what the psychological output of all of that will be until people start coming out of uh, um, the, the, the stressful lockdown phase. Uh, post traumatic stress is caused post trauma, it's called post traumatic for a reason, it, it tends to evidence itself after the event. There's been various other things, supply chain disruptions. You know, we, we, um, we've seen that all over the place um, uh, and some of that political, some of it economic and, and a lot of it caused by, by the lockdowns. Customer behaviors are changing. Technology has certainly come front of house rather than being uh, a backup service. And uh, our IP and knowledge and how we deploy it, particularly for those of us in service businesses, is a very different concept now to what it was uh, 12 months ago. And all of these impacts are issues of uh, organizational resilience and readiness for the future. And how we respond to them in a way will dictate how successful our organizations end up being. Uh, and indeed how uh, quickly we recover both socially and uh, economically. And it was into these discussions that we were, we were pitched uh, uh, last year 
largely working with um, uh, some Singapore agencies and, uh, and some education ministers from the ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia, where they've identified another interesting issue, which again, I suspect applies to many of us. And that's that our domestic market, as we open back up again, is likely to be smaller than it was a year ago. And if we are going to succeed and retain employment and indeed grow employment, we are going to have to look for other markets and other opportunities for uh, retaining income as well as growing income. So there's an international dimension to this, how ready, particularly our, our mid-size organizations, to think about the fact that their, their market of a year ago is no longer their market potentially to the same extent and therefore they have to be ready and able to go looking for market elsewhere. I'll give you a simple example of that, that the, in the last 12 months, we have worked virtually because of course, as an education institute, uh, as, a, as an exec education institute, um, we, we have a tradition of being very classroom based. We have our campus for a reason, uh, but in the last 12 months, we've worked across 80 plus countries uh, as um, delegates and students have connected to what we do because everything we do now is both virtual as well as physical. That's a change that will stay, but it has implications for how we organize. So into that, we started talking about three things. Um, how do we as businesses uh, and as business communities refocus uh, our organization? then reshape it and then respond to uh, the marketplace we see. And we defined enterprise readiness and resilience as the capacity of an organization to do those things, to refocus and reshape its offering, its value chain, its technologies, its skills, leadership and finances, to respond to that changed world, to rebound and grow in a sustainable and scalable way, both domestically and internationally. And that's probably the nub of the challenge for most of us as, as organizational leaders, as we look forward, whether you're uh, an SME enterprise or a corporate or a multinational, uh, to one extent or another, um, these three things have to be dealt with and, and addressed going forward. So from that was born the Enterprise Readiness and Resilience Program as a concept. And, uh, and it essentially has five core objectives. Uh, the first is to enable organizations like us to rethink and recreate their capacity in, in seven enterprise resilience factors. Number one, what's your business model look like? Um, we do, we have a long-standing reputation in organizational design and organizational development, as many of you will know. And uh, the amount of inquiry we're getting from organizing, organizations saying that we need to rethink our structure, our model, our operating models, because the world we're coming into is not the world we, we left behind uh, a year ago. Uh, finance, uh, many organizations uh, have, have burned an awful lot of cash, have taken on an awful lot of debt, uh, how to restructure and rethink a balance sheet in order to start to grow again and, and, and look ahead is a big part of enterprise resilience. One of the interesting things is, um, is, is the issue of globalization. Uh, we, what, a lovely example of this is Canada. Canada gave up its capacity to produce vaccines some years ago on the basis that in a globalized market, uh, if you needed it, you could buy it. The problem with vaccination, as we've now found out, is when you need it, so does everybody else. Uh, and therefore, if you don't have capacity to reduce, you kind of have to join the queue. Um, and there's an interesting strain developing, uh, a conversation thread developing around supply chains and deglobalization of some things and relocalization of some things. And certainly we will all, for those of us involved in international business, need to think about what remains globalized and what needs to become localized. And then several things spin off that. Where are our customers, both now and in the future? How do we plan 
uh, to access new customer markets and new customer bases? How do we pre protect our intellectual property, uh, particularly in a digital environment where it's very easy to accidentally give away your IP? Uh, and what is the implication of all of this for the way our people go to work, do their work, how leadership and management are done uh, uh, and, and enacted through organizations. So these seven enterprise resilience factors form the core of the program. Uh, and, and the purpose of the program is to enable organizational teams to think these things through, replan them, uh, in order to rapidly uh, return to, uh, to their markets in a positive way. In addition, we want to identify and maximize things we've learned. Uh, a year ago, my organization would have kind of laughed if we'd said most of what we do is digital. Uh, today, everything that we do is in the digital domain. So we've learned an awful lot about how to educate uh, uh, workforces and leadership and, and boards and others in the virtual environment. Uh, and we want to retain and, and, uh, and, and um, maximize that learning. We've also discovered some weaknesses in ourselves and, and uh, that's true of many, many organizations. And we may want to address and mitigate those. Certainly coming forward and looking forward uh, many organizations that I talk to are, are, are in a deep conversation about what are we for, what's our purpose, what's our mission, how do we need to change our culture to respond to different workplace environments and different kinds of ways of doing business. And indeed, sustainability and inclusiveness have become front of house issues now in, in the new uh, organizational conversation. How do we become, we become more sustainable and more socially inclusive uh, in terms of how we understand the value of work. It's fascinating to me that most key workers in most sectors are some of the worst paid in, in, their, in their respective regions and countries. In fact, almost always are some of the worst paid. And yet we have been blithely calling them key workers at the same time as uh, rewarding them as little as we possibly can. Uh, those kind of practices and, and, and the implications of those kinds of practices need to be thought through. But what we also want to do is use the program to bring organizations together um, to explore opportunities for cooperation and collaboration, for expansion, for setting up joint ventures or special purpose vehicles or acquiring each other or whatever they might want to do. And we're working with one of the, the larger audit and accounting firms to identify those organizations so we can pair them off and through the program, enable them to start to structure the plan by which they come together. Uh, and uh, uh, so that by the end of the program, they're ready to hit their new markets hard in, in their new format um, as, a, as a joined entity or as a special purpose entity and, uh, and return to growth. So those are our objectives. And the modules, as I say, that there are these seven modules, uh, designing new business model, looking at financing, uh, how do we respond to customers? How do we manage and protect our IP? Uh, to what extent does the world of digital now need to be embedded in what we do? Uh, not everything that has been digital in the last 12 months will remain. So uh, I, I've developed a habit of shouting at the radio in the mornings over the last few months for, for want of anything better to do. And there was a lovely example yesterday morning as um, just before the shops opened, where there was yet another question asked by yet another interviewer on the Today programme on Radio 4. Do you think people will come back to the shops? Like this was a question that even needed asking. Uh, only to see the queues of people waiting for shops and shopping centers to open. We are an interaction-based animal. We, we, we're not going to stay digital only for very, very long. However, behavior has changed, and that impacts supply chain, it impacts IP and all of those things. So those are the seven modules that, um, that, that make up the program. Now, 
what we wanted to do is create a journey. And, and the reason we want to create a journey is because um, this program is not a learning program as such. It's a business development program. It's very deliberately designed to enable uh, a team from an organization, large or small, to come through step by step by step by step over a period of time and redevelop uh, the premise, the planning, and the operationalization of that planning uh, in, in a way that responds to uh, the world that we're now in. So the modules are grouped, uh, and um, uh, clearly there's an induction kickoff to introduce everybody to everybody. Um, the first two modules are around business model design and finance. Second two model, modules are around customers and supply chain. Uh, the third pair are to do with digital and intellectual property. And then the final piece is to do with uh, people and leadership. And in between those pairs is what we're, what we're describing as an action learning process, which is a very deliberate uh, planning process where um, the, the teams attending the program will redevelop their business plan based on the two previous modules that they've, uh, they've just completed. So uh, the first action learning will be around redesigning uh, the business model and, and the financial model that goes with it. The second one around customers and supply chain, the third one around digital and, and, and intellectual property and so on. So by the end of it, those four pieces come together as an integrated, ready to go. Um, I, I, I very rarely quote Boris Johnson, but it was such a ridiculous thing to say that I've started saying it, an oven ready plan. Uh, that, that enables your business to, to get back into uh, uh, the marketplace effectively, positively, uh, and, and in a well-coordinated way. So the journey is designed uh, to be developmental for the organization in the sense that it helps redevelop the plan that the organization has. Now, because we, we were involved with, with um, and we are involved in discussions with, with um, both government bodies and, and business bodies, there was, uh, particularly in Asia, a desire for some of this to, to have um, uh, an accreditation aspect to it as well. So we are actually offering a professional diploma at the end of this in, in, uh, in organizational practice. So... Um, now that's not a compulsory bit, it's an additional bit if people want it. And um, in order to achieve that at the end of each action learning process, there is a program impact assessment of the plan that's been developed uh, in order to ensure that it meets or is likely to meet uh, the standards that have been set. And that assessment is, is with um, external facilitators from us or from, from our partners. And at the end of the process, there's uh, the option of a business pitch to a group of senior business leaders from various different sectors uh, and indeed um, to a business pitch uh, um, from um, finance uh, companies and private equity and growth investment bodies who may or may not want to invest in the plan that has subsequently been produced from this program. The action learning process and, and, the, and the impact assessment that goes with it has really three elements to it. It's, uh, first is to inquire what are our critical goals as regards these two modules that has just been done. Um, what do we currently know? What are other people doing that's potentially best practice? And then to move that knowledge into the second phase of saying how usable is some of this new ideas and best practice for us? Uh, and how can we... Uh, create sustainable uh, 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 responses to those, to those ideas. And then from that to develop a plan, what are we going to change? How will we monitor progress? And how will we, how will we improve on that change aspect as we go along? Um, so each of those workplace action learning phases produces a part of the overall end resulting plan. Now, uh, we're in the digital world, so we've also looked at how do we go about doing this, either either physically or virtually or both. And we want to do it either way or both ways, depending on the structure of the groups involved. 
So each of the modules in a classroom version lasts for two days, um, or in the virtual version is between six and eight two hour sessions scattered over a two to four week period. And we found over the last 12 months that, that um, when people do digital, they want to do it in chunky bits over a period of time rather than very condensed. It's, it's really quite draining to try and do a day of developmental work online uh, uh, like this. So, so the, the, the two days get scattered over a two to four week period in, in the virtual version. There's linking work between each, each pair of modules and the modules can be taken as an entire program or can be taken independently of each other. So, for example, if, if your issue is, well, we need to know, under, know and understand what our options are around new target operating models for our business, and you just want that, then you can buy into the business model uh, module. Uh, if your issue is to do with um, finance or digital strategies, then you can just buy into those things. So you can either go through the whole process or parts of the process as, as you need. Um, and, um, uh, and as I say, they, they can either be in two-day um, classroom formats based in, in our center in Horsham uh, or indeed elsewhere, and, uh, uh, or uh, six to eight hour, six to eight two-hour modules over a two to four week uh, period. So very flexible. Um, what are we trying to solve? We've talked about the, the business environment changing, the financial position of businesses have changed, supply chains have been disrupted, the staff and managers and leaders have been subject to real extremes of pressure and stress. Uh, one of our partners is, 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 was telling us this week that the, or last week rather, that the, the single most in-demand program they're running is, is, is a program called Mental Health for Managers, which um, as, as a title even is, is quite interesting, but, but reflects just that, that pent up stress and anxiety that a lot of people are are feeling. What we want the learning outcomes to be at an organizational level uh, is to learn how to understand how to design and deploy an operating model, how to manage liquidity balance sheets and banking relationships better, how to, how to rework supply chains uh, and, and digital approaches to business and indeed how to access clients using um, those new methodologies. Um, particularly to look at, at the cultural aspects of how teams and management and leadership work, encouraging dialogue, encouraging emotional support, particularly for dispersed teams. Uh, the most common thing that people are reporting as an outcome of working at home is the sense of emotional disconnect. Uh, so we spend a lot of time talking at each other online. We don't necessarily connect with each other. Uh, in the ways that we can only do uh, face to face. Um, but, but also delegates will learn broader methods of analysis, of reflection, of strategic and critical thinking, of scenario planning, strategizing to better enable uh, you and your organization to think itself through uh, as, as it starts to emerge uh, from uh, from the, the, the lockdown period. And this, as far as we know, and certainly from our, our partners uh, around Europe and in Asia have, have, have said the same, is the only program that's seeking to integrate all these business aspects into one re-planning and re-emergence uh, uh, process. So how does the program work? Now, again, we wanted to do some fairly innovative things um, around how we engage organizations. So firstly, um, we do want to know that the organizations coming into this, this process are committed to growth, whether that's in their domestic or their international markets, are prepared to work with another organization through the program as a, as a pairing if they see an opportunity for collaboration through and after that program, or indeed if they want to um, learn from different organizations in completely different sectors, how they view the same problems. And one of the strengths of the way we want to induct this process 
is we will we will have no more than six organizations going through it at any one time as a cohort. Um, so the cohorts will be quite tight. Um, each one of those teams, uh, each one of those organizations will need to send three to six people to represent their organization. But each one of those organizations will be from very different sectors and segments. And the idea is that we start to learn from each other how we, uh, how differently sometimes we respond to precisely the same issues. So how does the manufacturing business uh, look to digital versus the service and technologies business? How does a capital intensive business regard its balance sheet planning versus uh, an organization that's got far less capital intensive activity? Uh, how does a domestic business think about marketing to clients versus a global business? So by, by putting different kinds of business in the room, we, we want to expose organizations, not to the same thinking, but to different thinking about the same things in order that we can take ideas that otherwise we would never come across uh, and integrate them in, into the, uh, the learning and the planning process. Um, so we want firms to, to, to come as a team because your team will then develop the plan uh, with and for your organization. And we're allowing the program to run um, in a very condensed format or in a very spread out format. Now, there are two reasons for this. The feedback we've certainly had in, in Singapore is that the large corporates want to do this fast. They want to go through it in 12 weeks flat, come out with a plan and then off they go and, and implement. Now, part of that is also that they get government funding to go through the program quickly. Um, uh, and um, so it's in their interest to do so. But on the other hand, smaller firms uh, for whom that might be a bit of a, uh, uh, an effort, want to go through things, through things much more, uh, in a much more measured way because the, the resource they're likely to put in the room is the same resource as is likely to be running some critical business functions. Um, so they, they may want to do the program in a, in a slower cycle than, than larger firms with, with, uh, with a greater resource. And so we will be running an SME track aimed at uh, smaller to mid-sized firms and a corporate track uh, uh, to accommodate that different speed. But our preference clearly is to blend those two types of organizations together so that they learn from each other and, uh, and we're looking at ways in which we can do that uh, if, if we've got two different cohorts running parallel to each other. But it's highly flexible is, is, the, is the nub of it. Uh, and it can run as fast or as slowly um, as, as, as a cohort wants it to run, provided that cohort is, broadly speaking, in the same mind in terms of uh, the time they want it to take. Now the lollipops is 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 a really interesting idea. Now this, uh, um, as an academic friend of mine says, if you're going to plagiarize, plagiarize with pride. Uh, this is um, an idea that comes from Canada, uh, from the Henry Mintzberg Institute, uh, and um, and and it builds on this idea of organisations coming to these programs as teams, in order that they can work on a team as a team on their organizational level issues, but also then connect as a team with their organization between modules. But where we want to add people is, uh, add a dimension is, um, is uh, if, if we can encourage teams to come as a pair. Oh, um, so that for example, team 1A has uh, uh, an interaction with team 1B where, where they may be from the same sector or they're from different sectors or the same sector in different countries or, or different size of business or they have complementary service provision and they want to learn from each other. And then they swap team members over. Same with teams 2A and 2B and teams 3A and 3B. Um, so, so that there's an exchange of knowledge, an exchange of experience, an exchange of practice uh, that, that those teams can build on uh, rather than just relying on the limits of their own knowledge. And, and we regard this as a really adventurous way to expose ideas 
uh, and different ways of doing things, but also to allow organizations to size each other up through the program as a potential partner or, or JV or merger target post program um, uh, that, um, that they may want to, to get into a discussion about. So this program becomes developmental to each of the organizations involved, but also sets up the potential for further integration and further cooperation later. Um, we will use, as I say, a maximum of three pairs of organizations per cohort. So it really is contained, it's very focused, uh, and that means a maximum of, of 36 people in the room at any one time, uh, physically or virtually, um, but working in their groups and building their business uh, planning as they, as they go along. Now, the Pulse journey is the way that we go about our learning and, uh, and the way we go about our development with organizations. And it works both, uh, both at individual and team and, and organizational level. And it essentially involves us working with groups to say, where are you going? What is the plot? What's the map that you want to achieve? Uh, how do we unlock the inhibiting factors that are getting in your way? How do we leverage things um, so that you can get the required help and input and thinking that you need? How do you turn that into something that can be signified and shared and then embed that back into, into your organization? So the planning process, the action learning process that runs behind the core modules allows this process to, to occur. Where are we going? What's in the way? How do we leverage our advantages? How do we turn that into signifying plans and then get on with it? Uh, so it's very practice oriented. It's very business oriented. And the fundamental object of this is, is to get your organization back into growth and back into efficient operation rather faster than it might otherwise, otherwise do. Now, time commitment uh, is, is clearly important. Um, so if you look at the modules, uh, it, it, they, one way or another, whether physical or virtual, they combine all together to take 15 days uh, over a 12 to 52 week period, depending on whether we're doing a, a rapid cycle or a longer cycle program. The action learning bits in between the paired modules, so the four um, planning, plan building parts of the program, uh, we reckon should take about three days over a two to three week period back in your own organization with that development team coming back and saying, right, this is the stuff we need to think about. This is the stuff we need to, to design. And then at the end of that two to three week uh, gap period, there's a two hour per team uh, impact assessment, which is essentially a pitch to a bunch of senior people to say, uh, tell us what your plan is, tell us how it works, and to give you some critique uh, as to how effective that plan is or where the gaps are or some other things you might want to think about. So that's the core program. Um, so all in all, uh, it's about a 21 day process over a 12 to, uh, uh, 12 to 52 week period, depending on uh, whether you, you're on quick cycle or long cycle versions of the program. Other things we're building around it, uh, executive coaching, but also team mentoring and subject matter specialism. So for example, if there's particular issues around um, supply chain or, or digitization, we'll bring a subject matter into your group uh, to help you with that. We're working at the moment on access to financing and advisory around financing and, and growth funding in particular, uh, because for many organizations, the critical factor isn't really the plan as such, it's how on earth to finance the plan at the moment. And, and the good news is, as my old corporate finance people are telling me, there's rather more growth financing around than there is demand for it at the moment. So this is a good time to be, uh, to be, to be working on that kind of thing, but also access to business networking. Uh, so we're part of, of larger business networks and that we can engage uh, the, the delegate organizations with uh, in order to uh, potentially enable access to market or, or access to partners in, in different places in different segments in different countries as per needed. So there's a series of elective options that can go around the core program. 
But the core program itself in total is about 21 days, by the end of which um, you will have developed a detailed plan uh, for your organization based not only on your best practice, but on shared best practice within, within that cohort. Uh, you'll be able to reshape and energize uh, and engage your people around that plan uh, and then respond into the marketplace and deliver on that plan and grow your organization. So those are the three uh, end game results of, of, this, of this process. And that's it, I think, uh, in terms of the, uh, of the program itself. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay. and open it up and uh, see if there's any well, questions thanks. or commentary. Thanks, Robert. I'll just, just butt in first. I was very interesting and very, very clear as, as ever. I think with the current audience you, you have today, you have a mixture of people. I think you have, you have people whose businesses could be directly interested in the programme and others who will be more interested from the perspective of um, how it could apply to, to their clients or, you know, the businesses that they deal with because they may themselves be sort of too 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 small from, but you can correct me if i've got that wrong perhaps that's something we can come on to in terms of the size of the business and how you'd engage with businesses of different sizes i feel that the discussion falls into two parts although i don't intend being at all rigid about it um there's there's the sort of the very interesting background issues that you raised you know the build up if you like to the program and there's the program itself and I just wanted to um, abuse my position, sort of as chair, to raise a question on the, on the former. So that is the interesting background issues. Mm. And the one that struck me is, you know, I'm absolutely with you when you say that, you know, the death of the office, the death of the high street, death of the shop, you know, that's premature to say the very least. But I think you also recognize that you know, some change will be more permanent, more lasting. Yeah. And I wondered if you could expand a little bit on that, on the areas where you think, as a consequence of COVID, we've, we've seen permanent change, or that wouldn't have happened otherwise, or at least has been accelerated, which I think is more likely to be the case. So if we kick off then, there, and then open it up to questions and comments. Very good. Thanks, Jeff. I th I th it's an interesting question because the... the um, a lot of the commentary uh, that we're all hearing at the moment um, really is describing how we've, we were there and we're now there. Uh, and somehow we're going to stay there forever. And, and uh, there's, there, there are any number of reasons why that's not uh, going to be the case. Um, and I think they fall into two camps. There's the micro reasons, which are about essential human connectivity. Uh, it's it's not lost on any of us, as I suspect, as you watch the news and and uh, and see the pictures on screen, how quickly people have got back out in into the great white world, having been given half a permission to do so. You know, so uh, we are we are interaction based animals, a lot of us, uh, to a greater or lesser extent. But even if you're the deepest deepest introvert, or even if you think you are, um, the the you still interact with people. Um, pretty much. So, so there's the micro issues of, of human behavior that will bring some things back. But there's also the, the, the rather broader macro issues uh, as to why the world can't remain digital. And that's that so much asset and so much money is tied up in the infrastructure of cities and, and urban living. Uh, that there's uh, short of writing off trillions of dollars of assets at a, at a national level and starting again, uh, you've got to do something with those with those uh, with those national assets, um, and and for those reasons alone, you'll find that that um, the, the the economic consequences of this world where we all live in Zoom boxes is so disastrous that there has to be a correction back to to a, a blended approach. And of course, some segments have no choice. If you're in healthcare, you can't really do nursing by Zoom. Uh, if you're in hospitality, you really can't do that by Zoom either. There are some things where you have no choice. If you're in manufacturing, ditto. Um, so there's, there's a, we've got to be careful that that doesn't turn, we don't end up with this divided world where some people have to 
go to work because they have no choice and others don't because, uh, because they do have a choice. So there, there are various social aspects to this as well. But fundamentally, the, as, the argument is one of asset management on the macro side and the, and, and the implications there are vast. Um, London alone accounts for 25% of UK GDP and most of that is face-to-face -face services. Uh, so, so it can't be the case that London is suddenly redundant because that's, that's, that's a recession like you've never seen a recession before. Um, but the micro issues of we ourselves like to be out and about with others uh, means that there will be a correction. And, and we all know if you want to have very personal or very intense conversations with someone, and Aristotle wrote about this 3,000 years ago, the more intense and personal and meaningful the interaction you want to have, the more face-to-face -face it needs to be. Yeah. Yes, thanks for that. That's very helpful, Robert. I think my own, one of my own perceptions as well is to some extent we're living on borrowed time at the moment. Yeah. Borrowed time in the sense that because it's only a year ago since we were interacting properly, we're still able to build on that. So that right. will sort of lose value as time as time goes on. Yes. Now, I should, at the, at the very beginning, have encouraged you to use the chat facility for comments or questions that some of you have. And please carry on doing that. Although I must admit, I prefer it where people comment or ask questions in, in person. Yeah. So please put your hands up sort of physically or electronically, if you have a question or a comment, engage in the discussion. Um, and while you do that, I'm going to turn to Richard Butcher. Sorry to put you on the spot, Richard, Richard but you, you have put a comment in chat. I'll take the first of your comments, first of all, which is, and again, because that's addressing one of the background issues rather than the, the programme itself. Richard, do you want to ask a question? It's in terms of the impact of, yes, of course, of Brexit yes. and IP and supply chains. Much better coming from you than me interpreting it. Yes. So um, I work for Coaster Capital in the Growth Hub. So we provide free business and advice uh, for SMEs in the Coaster Capital area, which is essentially West Sussex and East Surrey. And the last 18 months, we've been very obviously focused and helping companies do exactly what the, the, the topic of this program is, and that is uh, get through the crisis and respond and, and, and grow um, to do with COVID-19, but also with Brexit. Mm -hmm. And uh, notice that some of the topics which are covered, like IP and supply chains, uh, as we all know from watching the news or working with our own businesses, for instance, Ragatwick Airport and Air Freight, for instance, um, that they've had a double whammy. So their supply chains are affected simply because they can't get goods over from Europe and so forth. So I just wondered if that's covered in the programme. And the other question is, what are the costs and are there any eligibility criteria for the programme? Very good. Thanks, Richard. And, and I, I know Coast Capital does some brilliant work. So, so uh, long may it continue that the... Um, uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm an Irishman, and uh, um, uh, so so uh, and uh, fourth generation retail family, and it's all in Ireland. So so uh, uh, when I talk to my family back home, this has direct direct consequences. Um, so yes, we did the and Brexit, of course, isn't the only thing that that has happened in the last twelve months. The the Trans Pacific Agreement uh, for the ASEAN countries and and all the Pacific Rim countries, which the UK is is urgently attempting to join, which is an interesting thing, um, uh, is another factor in terms of how, uh, at an international level, you go about uh, building your business. And to come back to Jeff's point earlier on, you know, first business I set up, gosh, many, many years ago, um, got to about 9 million before it became international. If you set a business up today, because the first place you go is the web, to set a business up. You're international from day one in your potential. Uh, and certainly by the time you're into a million of revenue, if you're not international, that's kind of surprising. Um, and that may be directly in terms of your client servicing or maybe indirectly that there's bits of supply chain you're not even aware of that sit uh, outside your business but impact the business you're running. 
So we're, we're all very much more interconnected. So one of the um, partners to this program is the Singapore Business Federation, for example. And um, we are talking to the UK equivalents over here. And I'm also a council member of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. So, so the Brexit thing I can, I can wax lyrical on because we do have policy documents on that, but uh, I'll resist. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the free trade experts are, are coming into their own at the moment in, in the sense of if you're a business looking to expand uh, in, into ASEAN, which is the fourth largest economic block in the world by, by GDP, uh, and a target for the British government uh, in terms of its public policy uh, towards, towards international trade and the so-called global Britain. So it's a re relevant uh, uh, area of interest, but you need to know your free trade um, rules, for example, in, in Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, wherever you might want to go. Um, and indeed, these days, even into Europe, where a year ago it wouldn't have been on your radar. Right now, you have to be thinking very carefully about rules of origin and all sorts of other things, as as the good people of the north of Ireland are, are discovering to their cost. So yes, that's most definitely in there. Um, the the cost that uh, again we we we're, we're still finalising. Um, the SME version versus the corporate version, because um, we do want to uh, have a small business element to this for the very reason that small businesses tend to internationalize. And so what we're looking at doing is, is potentially a shorter, sharper version of this. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so we, we, we are still, we're still talking around that with some of our partners. For, for corporates and medium-sized businesses, we're looking at, at a cost to put a, bring a team through the 21-day process uh, of between 25 and 30,000 uh, pounds per team. Uh, and, um, and in common with the conversation I've had with Steve and Manor Royal Bid, where, where the offer we're making to both Manor Royal and GDB firms uh, is is we're going to put a 50% a, a, a discounted pilot program together for the UK um, uh, with the intention of launching that at the beginning of May. So if, if the two organizations can find six members between them that want to work through that process as a pilot, then, then we'll happily do that. We're going to do a similar pilot in, in Singapore as well. The, the intention, uh, once the pilots are done, um, and this is where you, you have to not um, uh, entrap your own marketplace effectively, is, is to have a global cohort of, of European entities and Asian entities that um, right from the outset are saying to each other, well, I want to work in your market, you want to work in my market, so let's, let's go through this program and this process together in order that we can build a joint uh, 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 proposition plan through the program and there's already a list of 50 companies sitting waiting in Singapore and the ASEAN countries for some European counterparts so if your business is interested in expanding in that area then we already have a list of firms that want to go through this program as part of a build-up to an alliance a joint venture or a market entry agreement or whatever so so but we're 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 happy to, to offer that as a, as, a, as a starting place for uh, Manor Royal and, um, uh, and Gatwick Diamond uh, organizations. And that reflects the fact that we see ourselves as part of the community of both. Thanks, Robert. And we will, of course, be promoting that, 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 that offer to our members, and I'm sure Steve Sawyer will be yeah. as well. So you'll be hearing hearing more from us. We've got a very interesting question from Olivia, which is about business growth in the light of you know sustainability. Mm. Before I come to that, though, uh, Olivia is going to pose that question to you directly herself. Um, I just want to pick up a bit more on this markets issue. Mm. You made a very interesting comment, actually. You, you talked about the domestic market shrinking. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to comment at this point because I'm obviously aware of all the work you're doing in seeking to connect businesses for, on the international trade front. So the point you were making, Robert, is that 
Um, businesses need to look for new markets. They can't rely on, on, on old markets. And I just wondered, Jeremy, whether, whether you had any reflections from all the discussions you've had. You know, are businesses embracing that or are businesses just trying to get back to exactly where they were before, which, you know, which may not be an option? Um, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And hello, Robert. Nice to see you all again. Hi, and the soup was delicious. I hope I didn't slow. <laughs> um, I think the, the, one of the interesting things about the COVID uh, past year under COVID is that the world has actually got a little bit smaller thanks to Zoom. And it's easier for us to engage um, across continents and so on and so forth. And in fact, one of the biggest limiters now um, is not the time to travel. It's the time of day. Um, so if you want to join in with something on the west coast of America, you've got to wait till the evening for us. Uh, if you want to wait for, if you're joining with something in the in the ASEAN region, then um, it's usually their afternoon and our morning. So the time of day is quite interesting. But what I've found is that businesses at the moment have a mix of um, desperate survival um, and hunger for content, contact and continuity. Uh, and what we found, and it's very interesting because being very specific, I did an event last year with the Philippines, We've got another one coming up with Bulgaria in a couple of weeks time. And those markets are really keen still to engage with the UK. Um, there's still a hunger out there for international trade, uh, despite any issues that we see as a result of Brexit, there's still this willingness to talk. Um, and we are in a very good position. We are still seen as a good economy. We are still seen as a strong place to do business with. And there's also, I mean, very specifically in Robert's area of education, UK, British, whatever, uh, education is highly regarded overseas um, and it's seen in, in all continents. So I think the short answer is that there is a willingness um, the the one issue is uh, really what sort of time of day or night you want to be up talking to people on zoom um and whether you've got tea or something a bit better in your glass as you're talking to them as well that's the other issue i think um but the uh, and the another part of it which i found is that uh, english is also still predominantly the common language of business um and much as that leads us to a certain arrogance you could say i think it's also a great opportunity Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Robert, did you want to come back? Into yeah, just now? just briefly because I'm I'm interested in hearing Olivia's question. That the, the um, and no, I think Jeremy's right, and and to see that I, and and it's interesting the way he's framed it because in in a way, what's opened up is an opportunity for organisations to look internationally, rather than it being a negative. I th I think that's a positive framing of it, which is very important, and um, the the the. Uh, but but the, the domestic markets, you know, the, the the UK is expecting to contract by about eight percent in the current uh, in the current financial year, and uh, and of course considerably contracted for greater more great greatly than that last year. That the so the domestic markets are going to be smaller for a period of time, um, and if you want to retain full employment in your organisation, you've either got to cut the cost of that employment. Uh, somehow, uh, or which is, an, and Bulgaria is an interesting issue on that front. I know of many British firms that are firing here or recruiting there and saving money in the process. So there's there's another sustainability issue for you. Um, and um, but so they've either got to cut cost of employment or they've got to find new revenue in new markets uh, in this in this shrunk digital world. I'll just I'll just come back. Of course, the other thing is that. Um, digital inclusivity uh, is is absolutely vital, and connectivity and and signal strength and speed is is absolutely paramount. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you started this by saying a way to improve the Zoom signal is mm. to do these two things. Mm. It shows, and particularly where we've got um, digital exclusion, uh, then that is actually going to be quite dramatic. But I'll um, yes, I'll, I'll let others carry on now. Thank you. Yes, it's taken me a year to learn those two tricks that Robert just mentioned. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, um, Olivia, with apologies for keeping you waiting. And uh, sorry, Matsujum, I, I have seen your question. I will come to you after, after Olivia. Uh, Olivia, sustainability. So please, at last, put your question or comment to Robert. No, no, no problem at all. And Robert, I mean, it sounds like a fantastic programme. And I particularly like the collaboration piece, where you're actively getting people to work together and the, the lollipop concept. It's great. Um, one of the things that you talked about was um, 
with you know, the, part of the goal of the program is a return to growth. Yeah. And I think in the new world and sustainable movement really picking up, there is something challenging about this relentless drive for growth um, that so many businesses will say to me uh, as a coach, well, we have to grow. Mm. Um, and that can be true. But actually, again, it, it talks to some of what you were saying about things becoming more localized and building local capability mm. that the mega global corporations may not be good for us. So I'm, I'm just interested on in your views yep. on that. It's a lot Ooh. of stuff. Sorry. It is. No, there's, a, there's a huge amount in there, Olivia. Now, I'm a member of the degrowth movement, just to clear a personal interest here. And um, so I agree with you. I mean, this, this reckless uh, more, 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 more thing is going to kill us all if we're not careful. But I, I see growth as being, as being uh, both um, capacity and intellectual in, in a way. And so, um, so for example, you know, what we do as, as an educating institute um, can either be done at a very surface level or it can be done at a level that has implications for the way people think about why they do what they do. Um, and my comment uh, recently to some friends of mine who are going through a bit of a crisis in their university whilst it goes to the mainstream is the world doesn't need another mainstream university business school that says, just make more, 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 more. It's not original and it's not particularly creative. Um, so we, for example, are, are working with, with a, a partner institute that we helped set up in Romania when the Berlin Wall came down and, and uh, the end of the Eastern Bloc uh, countries. Um, to increase its capacity to do the kind of education that we do uh, for the markets and relevant to the markets that we're in. And we have a partner in Kenya where, where, we're, where we're doing the same thing. And, and, um, and that to me is growth. You, know, you don't have to be running vast amounts of material around the world. It's, it's enabling capacity where the capacity is needed in order to create sustainable and healthy and, and, and well-developed communities. So there are ways of doing growth which are both sustainable and inclusive to the places that you want to work in. That's the way I see it. I think, we're on, I think we're on the same page there, Olivia, I think. Did you want to yes, come so back I, on that I, at all? I could, um, I could violently agree for hours, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, but my, my challenge is the markets and the markets yeah. drive for purely financial growth, which means totally. constant... Yeah drive you know down uh, mm. driving down value for yeah. consumers and up for oh absolutely i mean that that you know that that's not let's not be uh, anything other than aware of of the risks to so-called um globalization of, of of workforces you know that the there is already a migration from high cost to low cost countries due to this process of digitization now whilst that is uplifting uh, at one end of the of that value chain it, it's it's downward pressure on another end and we already have many marginalized uh, communities in the the g7 and g20 countries uh i can't remember who said it once but there was somebody from the un who said it's remarkable how many rich people there are in small in poor countries and it's equally remarkable how many poor people there are in rich countries and 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 we're in we're in a danger of ending up in a sticky middle where nobody's happy. We've we've, we've got to think through the ethics of digitization quite carefully. Nice. Thank okay. you. Thank you, um, Ansu Juma. Would you like to make your comments? Okay. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, Robert, thank you for your presentation. I find it stimulating and thank you, Esther. Very interesting. But as usual, it does one thing I've noticed because during this uh, lockdown, one of the blessings for me was that there are now so many programs that one can attend without paying. <laughs> I've just <laughs> attended one which That's was 3,000 sure. pounds and it's sponsored under the Small Business Leadership Charter. Yeah. You know? But before I ask my question, just a simple question really, because the reason I said that is because it sounds like it's your passion, what you like, mm -hmm. but there's something that, Jeff raised, which somehow hasn't been addressed. But in fact, there may be no need to even address it because Jeff's question was, to what extent is this program accessible to those very small businesses? I mean, of course, the immediate answer is, it's not really because you're asking for at least six for each organization. Yeah. Um, and one of the problems we know is that even in the last year, despite the 
COVID-19, over 30,000 small businesses have folded up. So I have said this before and I'm saying it again everywhere I go. We really need to rethink and see how can we help small businesses to attend a program like this. Because in the last course I went to, what we, just, what we come to conclude about was that all these are very good, but a very small business person is actually hasn't got the luxury of what the kind of organization you are talking about has. He or she has to be the chief executive, the chief information officer, the chief digital officer, the chief operating officer. And oh, he has to be one person doing that. Uh, yeah. But all I'm saying is I have no answer yet. I'm thinking about it. But we need to consider to what extent can we allow very, very small organizations to be part of this. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a powerful question, Mansur Juma, and thank you for, for raising it. it, it I mean, there's a difficulty. It's, there is no easy answer to this. Um, the, the problem with, with micro businesses in particular is, is, and they are one person businesses quite often, taking time out to do something like this is, there's no money, you know, the, you, so you, the, it's very difficult. So you've got to take the thing to them rather than them to the thing uh, insofar as you can. Now, we as an education charity do, do have this firmly in mind that, that what, what um, our charitable charter says that we have to work for the well-being of people at work. That's, that's, that's the charitable goal. And we are, as colleagues of mine on this call, passionately committed to making that happen. Uh, but we also have to survive in the world as it is. Of course. And um, and like any any um, management school with a with a campus, we've we've got relatively high costs. So 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 my answer to you is 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 probably aspirational, but it's aspirational with a purpose in the sense that we we want to be able to we we put a certain amount of our time into pro bono work, and we want to use the funding coming from. Um, medium and larger size organizations in this program to run pro bono versions for micro program micro organizations where instead of on each lollipop table instead of one firm there's maybe six firms mm. uh, and and then you have six times six firms in one room all talking things through mm. um, there's a cacophony of ideas likely to come out of that kind of process but but what what a process that could be um, we need to think about issues of, of contracting it because time is an issue. Time literally is money and survivability at times. Uh, and we need to find ways of putting that into localities rather than saying, you know, we're over here, you've got to come to us. So there are logistical elements to that. Um, but, but yes, we are committed to, and it's part of our charitable objects that we do a certain amount of work pro bono and and that's the only way as an independent charity and a relatively small one that we can access that community and help it. And, and I think working with organizations like Gatwick Diamond and like Man of Royal Beard to say, well, because you've got micro businesses in your membership. Uh, and, and if we can establish uh, fee paying versions for the larger firms, we'll very happily do pro bono versions for the, for the micro firms. As a, as a kind of a payback. Very happy. Thanks thank very much. And thank you, Mansu Juma, for raising that very important issue. And it's certainly something we will take forward. And I'm sure Manor Royal Bid will as well, you know, with Robert as we develop that sort of pilot stage that, that we, that, that Robert mentioned a little earlier. Um, NASA, I'm going to turn to you. Um, so be ready. Um, Robert, in your sort of introduction, you did raise the issue of finance and raising capital and, and mm -hmm. how the programme could help with that. Yeah. NASA has made some comments and raised a question sort of relative uh, or relevant to that area. So, NASA, could I invite you to make your comment or yeah. add or pose your question? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a simple one, really, Robert. I mean, yeah. uh, I've, I've, I've phrased uh, quite a, um, uh, a series of tier one in the visit innovative visa scheme funding uh, and they've been pretty successful um, but also just doing uh, as I said in my um, uh, in my chat box I'm doing some pretty innovative capital raising for some green energy and sustainable mm -hmm. uh, companies and start some of them are startups uh, and some of them have created new codes 
um, um, supported by the Topco. Yeah, uh, I seem to be the, the interest I'm getting in terms of the investment of, is from abroad. Yes, and there seems to be quite a, a firm, in some cases, a, a really bizarre firm no from the Angel and VC network that I have access to here in the UK. Mm. Uh, and, and I wonder if that's going to be a challenge because it does seem to me that the the VCs and Angel Network that I've, I've reached out to have been really, really selective, whereas the the investors from abroad that I've brought in to the UK have seemed very, very open to understanding the the sustainability challenges, the energy projects that I've put in front of them, as well as the, the longer term gains. Uh, right. It's a shame Olivia's just gone because it's not immediate growth. It, right. They've seen it beyond. Yeah. They've seen it beyond the fiscal mm. growth aspect. They've seen yeah. it as you know, a a change of climate uh, opportunity. That's what they've right. seen. That so right. it, it is it, a pity that she's just left no, at is. the time <laughs> that I've, I've just. Uh, yeah, she has apologised. Yeah. No, it is a shame that she's just gone. Actually, that's a, I mean, just on a broader point, that's a, you know, we would we would welcome your participation as as somebody as an expert in terms of, of funding as well. But to give you some of my background in it, so I spent several years with, um, running the European end of one of the so-called next four um, accounting and audit firms, and um, and I've also been a member of the European Business Council for quite some time. But the um, the the uh, and one of the things that we set up was a, was a process called Elite, which is uh, based out of Borsa Italia. Um, and started off actually as very much like this program as, as having a series of development lodges around business planning and then a, a pitch to investors at the end of it. So, so we have quite a bit of access to um, uh, alternative funding uh, agencies, whether they're government, non-government, central, so Central European Development Bank and various others, as well as private, equity, private equity and growth investment, which are two very different things these days. But uh, you, you're noticing something that's been happening for a while, I think, which is that um, certainly growth investment is becoming heavily verticalized. It's very specialized around particular things. And if you're outside that particular thing and you don't need enough money, then they're just really not interested. And, and getting seed investment into interesting things tends to come from abroad these days. The, 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 the UK liquidity market is massive, but the UK has a really poor history with seed investment of early stage firms, a really poor history. Uh, and it's interesting that you're right, the investment tends to come from outside and, and particularly from Asia. Uh, and and to some extent from America. So, but that's one of the, again one of the interesting things about growth financing is is um, I'm not sure if Martin's still on the call, but you know every banker has has global global competition these days for for investment, and there are more and more alternative financing models out there. The danger is you never know what's you've got to be very careful was where where has the original money come from that then comes through those alternative financing mm. models sometimes it's not transparent and neither is it particularly healthy so as you know you've got to you've got to do your due diligence on those things quite carefully um but one of the issues to go back to Mansa Joma's point is is if if you're a micro business in this country trying to grow you've just got about everything possible stacked up against you uh, in terms of your capacity as a, as a G7 economy, your capacity to access growth investment is frankly abysmal by comparison. Okay. Well, thank you, Robert, and, and thanks, Nasser. Um, we are losing a few people as lunch beckons and other meetings, um, and I haven't got any further questions coming up on chat. So I'll just check whether any anyone has a question. If you could stick your hand up or... Wave in the air. Yes, Mansur Juma. Sorry, you're on mute. You're on mute, Mansur Juma. You need to unmute. Yes. That's it. Yeah, it's okay. fine. This must be your favorite topic because you started by saying about different cultures, particularly the Asian cultures. Mm. And throughout your presentation, you brought in Asian and everything. So what I really want to know is what specifically are they doing differently that we may need to learn? 
That's a really interesting question, Master Joe. That the now I'm a cultural psychologist by training, so, so that's possibly why I end yes. up doing this a lot. And I spend a lot of my working life around the world running businesses. So, so um, what's different? Um, if you go to my home country, which I, I haven't lived in for many, many, many decades, but um, the Irish government has a, a strategic workforce plan. Beautiful. The document is great. It's lovely. It's totally unfunded, uh, as, as the UK plan is, and, or, or the funding is pitiful versus the challenges that are allegedly going to be met by the plan. Um, look at what the Singaporean government is doing, and... Um, uh, the the and and indeed most particularly the Chinese government is doing, and they have five, ten, fifteen year directly funded investment plans um, on workforce transformation, and the, the the change in Asia in a way is what the Germans have been quietly doing very successfully since the Second World War, which is managed capitalism. Um, where the government is a strategic and consistent player in the development of talent and capacity and, and technology infrastructure and various other things um, in, in ways where in the Anglo-American model, it just isn't. It pops in, pops out, it follows trends, it messes around from left to right and up and down. And, um, and if you look at the productivity per man hour worked in, in the UK, you can see the results of it. It, it, it performs very badly internationally. The, uh, as a trading nation, you know, the, the, the UK government could do worse than go sit down, listen, watch, observe, and learn what some of the Asian governments are doing. Because the, the long-term medium plan commitment to uh, workforce transformation is directly and deliberately and massively funded. That's not the case in this country and in several other European countries. Um, the Germans probably being the, the, the yes. notable exception to that. Okay. Putting your, money, putting your money where your mouth is, basically, <laughs> is the difference uh, at, a, at a human capital level. Yes. Okay. I will um, draw things to a close there, if, if, if that's okay. That, that's been excellent, uh, Robert. I think there's been some excellent contributions as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Um, of course, today's session is just a taster. Uh, to start getting the message out there. We'll now, and I'm sure as I say, Manor Royal Bid will as well be reaching out to a much wider audience. Uh, both Manor Royal Bid and Gatwick Diamond Business have a, you know, a really strong range of, of member organisations, both in terms of size and sector. Uh, and I'm sure we can get some very good blends together you mm. know, to develop the programme, yeah. you know, to benefit the programme, but also to benefit the businesses as well. Right. And, right. and the individuals. So if, uh, if we could just thank Robert. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for thank the you very conversation. Much. Physical, physical applause for you, uh, Robert. That was excellent. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Now, Louise has Thanks done it the modern way. There we go. <laughs> yeah. got electronic and physical clapping. There we go. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again soon.